The Orion Mission Hello everyone, and welcome to the channel of King Tutankhamun. Today we are taking a look at the Orion Mission. The next moon landing can come. However, this would have not been possible without the ESA, the European Space Agency. Let's go. Since the end of the space shuttle program, NASA technicians have been developing a new space launch system, along with a new manned spacecraft named Orion, designed to once again lift astronauts beyond low Earth orbit and return them safely home. Long term, Orion and the SLS will serve as both transport and a home to astronauts during future long duration missions to our moon, an asteroid, Mars and other destinations throughout our solar system. In the name of this sister, NASA's first lunar program from 1961 to 1978 was named after the Greek god Apollo, the driver of the sun chariot. The name of the lunar program revived in 2017 is Artemis, derived from Apollo's sister. She was the goddess of the moon in ancient Greece. The Artemis program spacecraft was named in reference to the constellation Orion. The Orion is to carry people to the moon and back for the first time since 1972. The technical demands on the mission are enormous, and would not even be remotely feasible without the contribution of German engineers. This will be the next big step for mankind. Donald Trump would love to fly NASA's new Orion spacecraft directly to Mars. The US president got the idea when he spoke to Peggy Whitson on the ISS via video link in the White House in July of 2017. Tell me, Trump prompts the astronaut, what's the plan with Mars? When are we going to send somebody up there? Whitson hesitates briefly, then refers to Trump's bill from the month before, which set the year 2030. But Trump doesn't want to hear about that. I think we should speed this up, he says on live TV. It would be good if we do it in my first term, or at worst in my second term. After all, he says, John F. Kennedy was able to do it in a couple of years when he landed on the moon. When the then NASA director Robert Lightfoot explains to Trump's displeasure that this is technically impossible because Mars is much further away than the moon, Trump has a new idea. If Mars is too far away, NASA should fly to the moon again. After all, the moon is also on the way to Mars. What all the people present think is a joke at this moment is Trump's full seriousness. Shortly thereafter, he signs the Space Policy Directive 1 and orders NASA to at least put people on the moon by 2024. A call for help from NASA. As absurd as this anecdote is, it nevertheless marks a historic moment, the official resumption of the legendary US lunar program, which made world history in 1969 with Neil Armstrong's first steps on the Earth's satellite and which has been in a deep slumber since Eugene Cernan was the last man to leave the lunar surface in 1972. Too expensive and without scientific added value were reasons given at the time, but such objections no longer play a role. After Trump's TV appearance, NASA must deliver, and that is a problem. After all, under Kennedy, the space agency had $120 billion in today's money and 400,000 employees at its disposal for the Apollo program in 1961. Trump, on the other hand, is launching the program without thinking about how to implement it. There is still no funding to this day, and so the resumption of the lunar program is also the moment of a historic admission for proud NASA. This time, it cannot do it alone. It needs help. Interestingly enough, it finds it in northern Germany of all places. It consists of 20,000 individually manufactured special parts, weighs around 15 tons, and is something like a $475 million life insurance policy for the future moon astronauts. Technically speaking, the so-called European Service Module ESM, is actually nothing less than the heart of NASA's Orion spacecraft, which is to fly two humans to the moon in 2024. Like the torso under our heads, this high-tech cylinder, which is 4 meters high and 4.1 meters in cross-section, sits directly under the crew module, and supplies the astronauts with everything they need to live. However, this neuralgic building block of the mission was not developed and built by NASA engineers, as has usually been the case for decades for key survival technology, 
but on behalf of the European Space Agency in an inconspicuous factory hall of the company Airbus Defense and Space in Bremen. If you ask NASA headquarters in Washington about the Hanseatic role in the next moon landing, the ESM likes to be portrayed as Europe's modest contribution to the US moon program. From the Germans' point of view, this is an understatement. After all, a moon landing would be completely impossible without the technology from Bremen. After all, the cylindrical module contains not only the spacecraft's main engine, but also the four basic elements of a manned lunar mission, air, water, fuel, and energy. So let's take a closer look at the German technology contribution. If, as currently planned, the first woman as well as the 13th man embark on the journey to the moon in 2024, they will each need about 3 liters of water and 1 liter of oxygen per day to survive in the crew module. In order to be able to provide these quantities safely, 4 water tanks with a total capacity of 240 liters, a nitrogen tank with 30 kilograms, and three separate oxygen tanks with a total volume of 90 kilograms installed in the ESM. Another key component integrated into the ESM for the lunar mission is the propellant tank. As soon as the Orion has escaped the Earth's gravitational pull after launch, with the help of powerful launch vehicles, the orbital maneuvering system installed on the ESM takes over propulsion of the spacecraft. With a thrust of 25.7 kilonewtons, which is enough to lift a minibus into the air on Earth, it is in combination with 32 miniature engines, something like the astronaut's steering wheel that makes maneuvering in space possible at all. For the approximately 770,000 km journey through the dark vacuum of space, 8.6 tons of nitrogen monoxide and methyl hydrazine is stored in four 2,000 liter tanks with one centimeter thick safety barriers. Without a constant and adequate supply of power from the service module, the crew module installed above it would quickly become a dead coffin drifting through space for the astronauts. Systems such as control, communication, water and oxygen supply, but also the air conditioning are not possible without electricity. Speaking of which, power generation for the entire aircraft is also the job of the ESA. This is attested to by four 7 meter long solar wings attached to the underside of the service module just like on an X-Wing fighter, and providing enough energy to power two households. Add up all the key German technology, and it's clear. If the Americans fly to the moon again, we'll fly together, explains Thomas Gersombeck, the German government's coordinator for German aerospace. Because half of the US Orion spacecraft comes from Europe. With the main focus on Bremen, it flies with the technology made in Germany. Lockheed Martin is the prime contractor for the spacecraft, the company began work on the spacecraft in 2004 during a competition for the contract which was valued at up to $8.15 billion when Lockheed Martin won it in August 2006. Orion was originally built for NASA's Constellation program that was intended to bring humans to the International Space Station, the Moon and ultimately Mars. The program was cancelled in 2010 after President Barack Obama's administration requested that NASA focus on other goals. At that point, NASA had already spent $5 billion on developing Orion, and Lockheed had been working on the spacecraft for about six years. In early 2011, NASA hinted that the Orion spacecraft could be repurposed for their new directive. The agency followed up with a plan for the multi-purpose crew vehicle, one that was relatively close to the previous Orion spacecraft design, but instead could be used for the new mandate. We made this choice based on the progress that's been made to date, Doug Cook, Associate Administrator for NASA's Exploration System Mission Directorate in Washington, D.C., said to reporters on May 24, 2011, it made the most sense to stick with the Orion design. Orion's first uncrewed test flight, known as Exploration Flight Test-1 or EFT-1, launched on December 5, 2014. This test flight marked the first time a spacecraft built for humans has flown outside low Earth orbit in more than 40 years, since the last mission of the Apollo program in 1972. The space capsule seemed to perform almost flawlessly during its four and a half hour test flight, NASA officials said. Orion soared 3,600 miles or 5,800 kilometers above Earth before turning around for a high speed re-entry. The parachutes and huge heat shield on Orion worked well during flight. 
the spacecraft beamed back some amazing images of the limb of the planet from its window during the test before it splashed down in the Pacific Ocean. NASA originally planned the next Orion flight in 2017, aboard the Space Launch System rocket, but the schedule has slipped to 2021. Astronauts will likely perform a previously unplanned demonstration of the Orion spacecraft's deep space rendezvous capabilities in a high altitude orbit around Earth. On the crew capsule's first piloted test flight, now scheduled for 2023, the new objective on the first piloted Orion test flight would allow astronauts and engineers to evaluate the capsule's ability to approach another spacecraft, demonstrating the rendezvous system before it's needed on future missions to dock with a lunar lander and the planned Gateway Mini space station in orbit around the moon. The astronauts on the first crewed Orion flight, named Artemis II, will oversee the ship's ability to operate in close proximity to another object in space, likely either the upper stage of the Orion's rocket or a satellite carried as a piggyback payload, NASA officials said. The Orion spacecraft will launch on top of NASA's Space Launch System, a heavy lift rocket comprised of core stage with four leftover engines from the space shuttle program and two side-mounted solid fuel boosters. On the first version of the SLS, named Block 1, a modified upper stage originally designed for the United Launch Alliance Delta IV heavy rocket will send the Orion capsule into orbit. Under NASA's current plan, the moon landing could occur on the Artemis III mission in 2024, but the schedule is aggressive. The development of a human-rated lunar lander is in the critical path for a 2024 moon landing. NASA selected industry teams led by Blue Origin Dynatix, and SpaceX last month to mature their concepts for a crewed lunar lander. The space agency and contractor teams will refine requirements and mission architecture choices over the next 10 months. Then, NASA is likely to select two landers to proceed into full-scale development. The Gateway, a mini space station to be assembled in lunar orbit, is needed to achieve an enduring lunar program, according to NASA officials. Agency managers say the Gateway will eventually be used as a staging point for astronauts on the way to the surface of the Moon, accommodating reusable lunar landers and contributions from international partners. The Gateway outpost will also host a range of scientific experiments. But NASA has decided not to use the Gateway for Artemis III, the program's first human landing attempt in order to alleviate schedule pressure. Instead, astronauts on the Orion capsule will directly link up with a lunar lander in an elliptical halo orbit around the moon, then proceed to the surface. According to NASA's current plan, the landing vehicle will launch on a commercial rocket without anyone on board, then maneuver into lunar orbit to await the arrival of the Orion crew. The first elements of the gateway could still be in position around the moon in time to provide communication relay support for Artemis III. Another major change to the Artemis architecture in the last few months involves how NASA plans to launch the first two gateway modules. The Gateway Power and Propulsion Element, or PPE, and the Habitation and Logistics Outpost, or HALO, were originally to launch on separate commercial rockets, then autonomously rendezvous and dock in the vicinity of the Moon. NASA's Deep Space Orion crew capsule cleared a key milestone and rigorous review this week at Kennedy Space Center giving it the go for flight to the moon next year, kicking off the agency's Artemis missions and humanity's first return back since Apollo 17 in 1972. Program managers conducted both a system acceptance review and design certification review, analyzed every spacecraft system, all test data, inspection reports, and analyzed that support verification to ensure every aspect of Orion has the right technical maturity to proceed towards Artemis 1. In effect, the review gives the stamp of approval to the entire spacecraft development effort and is the final formal milestone to pass before integration with the SLS rocket, says NASA. In addition to the spacecraft design, the review certified all reliability and safety analysis, production quality, and configuration management systems and operation manuals. But before stacking Orion on the rocket, there is still some more work to be done on the spacecraft. Technicians have to install coverings to protect fluid lines and electrical components on the crew module adapter that connects Orion to the service module. Its power-producing solar array wings still need to be installed too, as does the spacecraft adapter jettison fairings that enclose the service module for launch, and the forward bay cover that protects the parachute system. 
The Orion Structural Test Article, or STA, wrapped up testing earlier this summer too, undergoing a punishing series of load testing to ensure that it can withstand intense violence and loads at launch and re-entry and tests to recreate the harsh blasts of in-flight separation events. The core of the rocket itself is currently undergoing a major test campaign at the agency's Stennis Space Center in Mississippi, known as a Green Run Test Series. The current plan is Artemis 1 mission entering a distant retrograde orbit around the moon, passing as close as just 62 miles from the lunar surface, and at its furthest point traveling a thousand times more than the International Space Station, some 280,000 miles from home. Barreling back home to Earth after three weeks, at an estimated lunar return velocity in excess of 24,500 miles per hour, as fast as any of its Apollo predecessors, Artemis 1 will splash down in the Pacific Ocean, clearing a major milestone for successive missions which aim to send astronauts around the moon and in 2024, the first woman and the next man to set foot on its dusty surface. And with that being said, we've come to the end of the video. Comment down below your thoughts. If you enjoyed it, be sure to hit the like button, subscribe, and turn on the notification bell for more awesome videos just like this one. This has been your King Tutankhamun. Thank you for watching.